Uh, but thank you very much for your time and your attention today. Um, the contents is noted. I'm going to be looking at the uh, developing and evolving requirements now on back to work for crisis and incident management. How do we actually create that preparedness? How do we capture it? And how do we showcase it, for instance, in our marketing? And I'll close off quickly with a few extra resources. My background I already gave earlier, but essentially a lot of big event experience from Olympics and football cups to political and business events. Again, uh, where you hear crisis management, you may also think in terms of incident or emergency management. Uh, I just want to put you in that framework of we're looking at situations where all of the hard work you've put in to manage COVID-19 incidents uh, goes astray and where you have to perform a form of crisis or emergency management. So let's look real quick at these requirements. What we've noticed is when we look at events in COVID-19, how much of a discussion now is going on between governments, health authorities on the one side, and event organizers and venues on the other. Um, part of that discussion is on the preventive. What do we need to do to clean the place, to do social distancing, to have all the proper requisites in place before we can have the event and we have our license to operate. On the other hand, there is what can happen uh, during the event or right after the event that we might need to react to. And think about incidents that can happen from fake news about you are not properly prepared to somebody becoming sick in an event and everybody at once thinking, ooh, that might be COVID, it might be the coronavirus, to failures of equipment as you're having hundreds of people come in the door to attend your event to a last minute cancellation because it turns out some staff are ill. There's a lot of different situations in which we might see some kind of emergency erupt. But when we think about incidents, normally those are small things that your staff on the floor, the working floor at an event uh, can handle. What we're most concerned about here is not those small incidents where they can simply help somebody, but where the risk um, and the problems become much larger very fast and we see the emergence of a potential crisis. And note please that when we look at media development, social media, extra relations, the amount of attention stakeholders have for events, the demands from the public for transparency, and regulator monitoring has become tighter. So all these factors have added to make a crisis more of a problem, both in the event sector and without in recent years in industry. And more than that, it's become a problem faster. I've seen that with more than 25 years of work with CNN doing guest appearances. Within minutes of some big incident or disaster, you get called in and you get asked to give people some guidance on the issue. But it just shows to me the power of how one small incident or emergency locally at your venue can very quickly become big news. And of course, becoming big news can result in all sorts of outcomes. So when we're talking about what a crisis cost, what's the problem with having a crisis? Well, in a lot of cases, it can obviously cost you financially, but more than that, disrupt your operation, have an impact on your reputation. And quite often, it's more than one form of damage um, in, in an incident. So you may have a lawsuit, you may have an investigation, you may have journalists looking at you, you may have stakeholders with questions of trust, and ultimately it could be a threat to your license to operate. So what we want to make sure of is that we're ready then to handle these COVID-19 incidents. The objective at the core is to be and stay in control at all times throughout our event. If you think about these requirements right now that we're seeing, a lot of them are still pretty general. They're still pretty ill-defined. They'll say, do things to stay six feet apart or one and a half meters apart. Do things to have a clean regime or a disinfectation regime. Do things so that physical distancing is promoted. A lot of this guidance so far has been on prevention. Um, and what's gradually changing now is that as frameworks are coming online and being developed, such as the one released this past week by UFI, 
Um, these frameworks are also calling for you to be prepared to intervene when it's necessary, when an incident does arise, when things do go wrong. And I think more and more we're going to see that call for being prepared to be uh, reactive on a crisis or an incident is going to be to standard. And the reason is that not just the customers, but also the regulators, other authorities, compliance professionals, lawyers, and insurance, more and more, they want it to be standardized and they want clarity that you are ready to control and handle your event. Ergo, you should have things in order. What it comes down to is that you will likely, in the future, need a demonstrable ability to manage COVID-19 related incidents and risks. And that's both in a preventive and a reactive standard. Essentially, people want to know, are you prepared for this and are you in control? When we're talking about actually creating this preparedness, well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. What we're doing is we're building on the shoulders of decades of work of experts in business continuity, crisis management, incident management, emergency management. What they essentially look at is controlling a series of risks around events, exhibits, congresses, you name it. If you look at the list on the right, controlling the risks too, these are the kind of breakdown functionalities or services or areas of attention that the experts will be looking at. What do we see there? What can go wrong there? What risks exist? And how can we mitigate that? Now, of course, with and environment risks focused on COVID-19. The specifics in looking at standards, such as those listed on the left, is going to be married up with best practice on how do I prevent crisis. So we're going to see more COVID-19, if you will, crisis management packages. Now, the other way to do this is to basically build a program. And when we're talking about a crisis management or a crisis preparedness or an emergency preparedness program, we're essentially talking about four main steps or four main components. One is you want to have the right team there, a crisis management team consisting of competent people, the right people to use, and we'll come back to that in a second. Second, you have to equip them with a policy and plans and procedures so they know how to operate, when to operate, with whom to operate, and it gives them some room to maneuver. Third, you literally need to think about where is this team of mine going to be functioning? You will have something like a crisis room, crisis management room, operations center, war room. There's all sorts of beautiful terms for it, but we're talking about a place where that team can meet. And the fourth, practice. We need to get instruction, we need to get guidance, we need to get training, including crisis management exercises or CMXs. When you think about crisis management or emergency management, remember that this is a management task. This may require people going to the media, people talking to other stakeholders, people sharing their thoughts and making big decisions to help mitigate risk. That means it's also a management task. So this is not something we can just delegate readily and park it down below somewhere in the organization. Top management needs to be involved in developing and structuring this capability. When you think about people and you think about a crisis management team, there's all sorts of guidance out there, but essentially you're looking at you need a leader, you need somebody who's going to log and record things, which will help structure how you do things, but also provide evidence after for investigators and how you did. You're going to need that health, safety, security, and environment function in there, particularly now with COVID-19. You will need somebody who can drive whatever needs to be done in terms of control measures, it's probably operations, and you'll need somebody for internal and external communication. Beyond that, it's going to depend on what the situation is or the crisis is, but often you will draw in extra, extra excuse me, expertise on whatever the issue is, and it may be from legal, it might be from IT, it might be from something else. When you think about policy plans and procedures, it sounds a bit heavy and complicated and like a lot of paperwork. In actuality, they're not that hard to develop, to put together, uh, to get a basic plan. For those of you who don't have a lot of planning on this, uh, including in the COVID-19 area, there is a lot of developing knowledge on this readily available from top companies like these. I just plucked these two as an example from the internet. 
They look like things that might have to be or should be internal documents, but they're readily available in all sorts of slides or sheds. As you go out onto the internet, you can find this kind of information openly. And of course, uh, when you call an expertise, uh, you can get assistance on making these kinds of policies, plans, and procedures to use during emergencies. Think a little bit about where you want to meet, how you need to equip that. Some leading practices, this is a picture I took at the World Forum here in The Hague in the Netherlands. They have their whole crisis management room set up in such a manner that they can't only use it themselves, but they even rent it out to clients who have a big event. So it helps them with their managing. When we think about practicing, there's four basic forms. Uh, there's lots of terminology around how do you practice, but these four acronyms stand for talk through exercise, a walk through exercise, a crisis management exercise, or a joint readiness exercise. And joint readiness exercise, in essence, means that you have uh, the people in your crisis team working together with first responders or other people outside of that room, and they're checking if they can work together well uh, in a bigger construct. When we talk about capturing preparedness, what do we mean? We literally mean, can you gather evidence of all you're doing in terms of emergency preparedness, crisis management, incident management? Find the documents in which you're making plans. Find copies of reports about your training. See if you can get slide sets or briefings that you have prepared. Are there pictures of you and your team actually practicing or meeting with officials to discuss particular risks? Are there members of your team who are members of particular professional societies that have certificates? Uh, are there perhaps articles that have been written about how your venue or how your event is prepared for emergencies? These are all essentially pieces of evidence that you can also use in bringing not just to regulators, but also to market. So when we're talking about how can we showcase some of this preparedness, essentially how can we market it, if you will, well, think about these four things first off. One is, can you simply include it in all of the documentation, presentation, videos, and things that present or represent your event or your venue? If you have a website, if you have a YouTube channel about your event, under such captions as resilience and preparedness and business continuity, crisis, crisis management, uh, management. Can you add some information about, hey, here we are in a training. Hey, we have a plan for this. Hey, we are prepared to meet a whole number of different kinds of emergencies and we've been trained by A, B, and C. So you can basically share some of this information in a very polite uh, and open manner. Secondarily, think about literally when you have visiting potential clients, um, you have other people who are coming to visit you. Could you share your plans? Could you show them, look, as part of our preparations for your event, to either organize your event or to host your event, please realize that also in these areas of emergencies and incidents, we are prepared. Um, I have seen such presentations literally done for visiting clients with PowerPoints on the, on the projection screen as well as paper laid out on the table. And often, if you have a client who sends a whole team with maybe an HR representative, a security representative, a safety representative, somebody from legal, it's very useful to show them how you are prepared because you are basically meeting and helping them meet their duty of care and their governance objectives to be prepared and to care for their people. Third, consider maybe using your crisis management room as a focal point to show other people what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're preparing. Not a lot of venues have this worldwide yet, but it's definitely a draw for those that do. It's a place where you can bring other people like first responders, police officers you work with, local authorities, regulators, partners, people from your insurance company to show them and demonstrate that yes, you are prepared and yes, you are taking the right steps in order to be ready for any COVID-19 type of incident. And finally, think, could you invite perhaps other people or other parties in your crisis management exercise? Imagine if you could take people along like 
the real life first responders who might be helping you if there's an incident. How wonderful would that be if everybody would know one another and if there is a real incident, then we can all work together smoothly. It's often found to be a big factor in smooth operations during crises, during incidents. Finally, think about, are you using some kind of tooling? You may well as part of your crisis management and your incident management regime. You may have particular booklets that you're sharing. You may use particular apps. You may use particular methodologies on social media by companies such as Twitter, which have specific crisis management capabilities. So does Facebook, so do other companies in that realm. Um, I'm just giving it to you for consideration. It's yet another way of demonstrating that you're thinking about prevention, but you're also thinking about reaction and how to be competent and how to be fast and how to be effective. And these two are things that you can showcase to third parties to show how prepared you are. Finally, I just wanted to touch on select resources for crisis management. Um, there's a whole number of organizations and associations out there that deal either with events or with crisis management, emergency management, or with security management and related fields uh, that have guidance on this. And uh, in particular, AIPC, UFI, and some of it in support with the ICCA have brought out some material on this in the last few years. And there's one particular resource because it's a resource that I personally helped developed and worked on uh, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, this thing is available if you just Google it online. It's an open document and within chapter one, good practice organizational security measures is a whole section dealing with crisis management and there's a number of live links to crisis management documents and resources. It's all free, it's all organized, but it can really help accelerate and kick off your effort in this area. Finally, um, Please remember that you're valuable in the sense that you're the one listening to my story right now. You're the one who might be listening to others talking about your readiness for a COVID-19 incident and your readiness to manage it. It's unavoidable over time that we're going to have some incidents at events um, where COVID-19 is a concern. And it may be sensationalized. It may be blown up or made bigger than it should be. But these kinds of incidents, we want to make sure that we can control them as, as best as possible. And the few things I was able to share with you today, I just wanted to stress, please realize how important you are to get this type of message and this kind of knowledge out in your organization to make sure somebody as part of all your efforts also takes this into account. It's often easier to put in your heart and soul and make a big effort to prepare properly for new requirements, to make sure that we're reopening in a smooth fashion in the COVID-19 era. But it would be such a shame if you have one little incident which you mismanage um, to, to cause you a lot of grief. So I just wanna emphasize your own importance in bringing the message forward. And with that, thank you very kindly. And I will return back to John Bradshaw, our presenter. Glenn, um, uh, these are all anonymous questions, so I can't tell you where they've come from. Your best guess in terms of a timeline for this? Uh, as a hotelier, I believe that the crisis can be solved, but of course, what kind of timeline? No one really knows. What's Glenn's view on the timeline in terms of normal and what is normal anymore? But, but what, was your, what would your view be in terms of uh, the meeting the events industry, um, organizers, suppliers? When will the industry, in your view, get back to somewhere like it was before this crisis? I hope that by uh, the fall that we're going to have some real form of new normal. And I think that it will be probably a third uh, of, of what it was for the moment. But I think it will take those two or three months right now, and hopefully that can be accelerated over the summer to figure out what basic requirements are if they're working and we can basically have safe events, uh, if the formula is to have them with less number of people or less density or spread out more over time or have them half physical and half virtual for those formulas to, to work out. It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation between governments trying to 
make up requirements and an industry trying to make up requirements and nobody quite sure what the exact requirements for a safe event should be. Uh, but I think in two or three months, we'll have a, a clear view on that. And then in another one or two months, uh, much of that will be implemented. So I'm hoping by the fall, we'll have some level of regularity back. Thank you very much. Um, interesting one. Do you think looking at how other industries are handling COVID, i.e. the cruise lines, and how they handle get back, getting back into operation could be beneficial for event management, event professionals? I, that, that's a bit of a difficult one to throw at you. I'm not sure if you know particularly the cruise liners, but do you think, I guess, how other industries are handling this and getting back on their feet? Can we learn? I mean, I, I guess, obviously, as a, a general thing, we should always look at other industries for insights any best practice you've seen or is it a bit early to say uh, i think we should always seek to learn from other industries and other sectors i mean radical change and radical improvement usually comes from without not from within you know? there's that saying about expertise you know only allows for incremental progress but if you want a revolution and a big leap ahead look outside of your own house um, certainly, I think uh, that sector, as well as hoteling, as well as a whole number of other areas, uh, think of uh, very small live entertainment, bars, restaurants, all of them are going to combine and, and provide options for us. Um, what we also have to be careful of is that they also teach us the lessons, uh, particularly when it comes to crisis management of where things go wrong. Um, but my short answer would be just for brevity and time. Yes, I think it's an excellent point. We should certainly be looking at other sectors and other industries. And it's, it's not that we should copy everything, but we should look for what are the lessons learned there? What's the concentrated new knowledge that they're developing that we might be able to apply to ourselves here because we are in a new situation and it is unprecedented.